begin with the invocation followed by the pledge, if you'll please stand. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for today. Just thank you for the last few days that have just been like spring. Just thank you for that. Just thank you for our city. Thank you for staff. Thank you for this council. Just thank you for our community. Thank you for our first responders, first responders and ask that you make sure they all get home safe every night. Just uh, thank you for the city and just protect us from evil. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll begin with the minutes from January the 24th, 2024. Move to approve. Second. We've got a motion by Wynn, second by McGee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're going to come down for some awards. officer, 25 years of service.
Now we have David Long, Assistant Police Chief, 30 years of service. Give it a second. I wonder about y'all. Look, it's the only it's the only joy we get out of it. All right, Z one. All right. Good, good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, the first item here is a request for a thoroughfare closure. Uh, this is for a, an unapproved alley right of way, uh, just located off of East Irwin Street. Uh, the uh, surrounding properties are undeveloped. Uh, there is a drainage channel that goes through the, the platted alley, and so it's unlikely that it's ever gonna be developed. Uh, no, none of the adjacent properties 
uh, we're opposed to the, the closure and the planning commission uh, recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Move to approve Z1. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McGee. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Z2. This is a zone change request from M1 Light Industrial to DBAC Downtown Business Arts and Culture District. Uh, this is for the, this is one of the adjacent property owners to that alley. Uh, they, they intend to rezone this to uh, make it more feasible to develop. Uh, they plan to put a triplex on the, on the lot, which is consistent with the, the future land, land use guide and the uh, development plans for downtown. It is a small property, but uh, the, the DBAC uh, development standards do allow for uh, this type of activity. And so uh, they are requesting to rezone it to DBAC to allow it to be developed. Uh, none of the adjacent property owners were opposed to the request and the planning commission recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? I do have one card from Brian Jackson. Do you wish to speak or just here for questions? Okay. Move to approve Z2. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McGee. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Motion carries. Z3. This is a zone change request from R1A single family to AR adaptive reuse district. This is on uh, East 4th Street and uh, Donnybrook. The uh, request is to allow for uh, the property to also be used as an office. I believe the, the owner currently has a a notary business that they would like to be able to have uh, customers come to the property. Uh, the surrounding properties are zoned for residential use uh, to the south across 4th Street that those are AR so this would be a continuation of that. Uh, this does not change the allowance for a single family home on the property it just allows for the addi additional light office use. As you can see here the property has uh, two driveways one off of Donnybrook on the northwest corner and then one off east fourth on the southeast corner of the notices that were sent we did receive one in opposition uh, for a total protest of 4.21 percent uh, that concern was uh, mainly about uh, safety at the intersection uh, from having you know additional uh, vehicle traffic or or cars parked along Donnybrook but like I mentioned there are two two driveways on this property that customers could utilize and that the owner could uh, suggest that, that they utilize the, the more safer more safe option so the uh, uh, the planning commission by a six to one vote recommended approval any question for Kyle yeah just Kyle real quick um, I noticed that he does have the two driveways and that's what's that some people reached out to me concerned about that is a very congested intersection is he applicant looking at maybe turning one of those driveways into customer parking uh, probably the East 4th Street driveway because there is less traffic yeah I think they've, they've looked at the using using that side uh, because the, they can utilize the driveway parking for their parking but also that East there's that that little portion of Front Street that's like the old East 4th Street there so there there is some space uh, on the street that they that might be easier to utilize but the the property does have at least um the minimum parking for uh, both uses and then they, my, i'm sorry go ahead. and then my second question that was proposed to me if the zoning chain is approved does it then potentially allow them to do more business a different type of business uh at this residential structure right it's, it's not it's not going to be limited to just the the notary office it, it would allow any of the other AR uses, which can be like an attorney's office or an architect's office, just light, light office in nature. Um, no, no real retail or, or anything like that. So when I was looking through the, the UDC, like no flower shop, no dental office, or is that, is that allowed? Uh, I believe like a, a medical office, but it'd be limited to, I believe three or, or less or under three, three or less uh, positions, but the site really couldn't accommodate all the parking that's required for that. Uh, I've got a card here from the applicant. Uh, Timothy Johnson, y'all want to, either one of y'all want to come up and speak? 
to this. If you just state your name and address for the record. Deborah Johnson, 402 East 4th, Tyler, Texas. Convince us. Convince you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we've been there 24 years. And I have, my husband and I are retired, but I have a notary license I've had for many years. And I have wanted to put a small sign out front by the sidewalk in the front and advertise that, but also to maybe take in a little business. It's not something that would be a lot of traffic and all. We've lived there and our parking is on the Donnybrook side. We have a three car garage and it's on the Donnybrook side. So the parking for anybody that would come to my home would be in the front. And in front of that um, fence and the gate, there's two parking and right in front of the house, there's at least two parking areas. So I don't foresee, but maybe one person here and there that would come and I would direct them to the front. So it's not, we'll be there. We've been there 24 years, but it's just something I would like to do is put a sign out. But I wasn't um, going to do that unless y'all approved it. So. Uh, I don't live very far from you and I've got commercial behind me. And at one point, an attorney's office asked me if I would be opposed to them purchasing the house next to me to them to, to add on to their attorney's office. And I said, I really don't want to be at my house next to an attorney's office. Not attorney. I mean, they didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> but, but next to, to an yeah, office. I don't company. appreciate that very much. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know how else to say this, but it, it seems like it seems like a, almost a drastic zoning change that'll be with the property forever just for a notary <clears throat> and and i don't know if if a special use permit if you can have a sign with a special use permit or well house. see the people across the street from us have a business he's but a they have parking out front not as much as we have though we have more and then there's an attorney's office directly catty corner to us so they've been there the whole time we've been there. And then next to them is that home center that used to be Janie's Cakes. They have a lot of parking. But actually, we have more parking. Where the people park in the front does not affect when that highway comes through, that 64. Do you know, you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about? But um, so we... But, you know, like I said, that's where we've raised our kids. That's where we are. That's our home. And so we're not planning on doing anything or moving. I'll be there till I pass on. <laughs> so, hey, if you open up a flower shop, I'm not buying flowers I would from not. You. I would never <laughs> open a flower shop. And I wouldn't do the other. I would not do anything. I love my neighbors. So I, I would not do anything that would be major that would be just not attractive, you know, to someone. So, anyway. So do, do you come ask about the special use permit? Yeah. Does, does that, would that allow sale for signage? The special use permit? Uh, for uh, SUP for signage, uh, the uh, special use permit could restrict signage, but it's not you know, the signage is based off of the zoning. So I think uh, perhaps the question may be more about uh, whether the a notary, a notary service uh, is a, could be a special use in, uh, in residential zoning. Uh, so we, we, we do not have that use called out or specified in, in the code as, um, you know, as a line item. So it doesn't, it has not been categorized. It's kind of fallen under other uses, perhaps like a like an account accountant's office or or, or a tax office, things like that. Although that's not the same thing. Uh, residential zoning does allow like barber shops and beauty salons up to two chairs in uh, residential with the SUP. And so perhaps if it's very limited in that nature, um, you know, two no two or fewer notaries in a residential district, perhaps the SUP could be something that, that could be explored. Um, 
that the the signage would still fall under the the zoning, which is still very limited for for residential, which is one square one square foot of signage. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to suffice for for the applicant, but um, I guess perhaps if we're looking for a uh, a medium between uh, rezoning the property for all different uses, but it, However, but instead doing a, a special use permit for this specific use, uh, that, that I guess that could be an option. Uh, that would that would be more uh, trying to think of whether we would need to kind of re-notify, restart that process. Um, mm -hmm. However, the what was approved or recommended and notified was AR zoning, which would allow allow a lot more. So perhaps that's maybe we don't need to do that. Uh, it seems like more restrictive to approve a special use permit here. Uh, so that, that could be an option here. Instead of the zone change, you could do a, an SUP, um, establish the, the length of time, uh, time. Typically, those are one to three years to start, you know, things like that. Ms. Johnson, would, would, would you be willing for, for us to look at that? Sure. Instead, going the SUP route instead of the AR route where we're doing a complete zoning change? Um, is that something that, um, I guess the other question I would like to ask, I know that I'm on that side, but I've got the neighbor, the people across the street we also know, and they're zoned, whatever, this, and those, and the attorney's office, and I would like to know if they can do that, why couldn't we do that? That's what I'd like to know. Because we're just across the across the street, and is there a problem with that? I think the be, the best thing that could you can understand the AR across the street is we really can't undo that. So as time progresses, whereas an SUP, and, and let's say that twenty years from now, I mean you may or may not be there, but somebody else comes in and uses that AR for something not as soft business if you will as a, what you're doing so this would be enable the city to revert it back to residential at a later date so an SUP is just a, a really really good fit for that you'd still be able to do your business if we do it for three years you don't have to show back up for three years and things change in three years yeah especially and, and, and also at the end of three years <clears throat> If there's been no issues and you want to come back and, and reapply for AR and you can say, you know, this this has been a piece of cake. I mean, there hadn't been any problems, and it's, it's probably more apt to to, to, zone, to do to, AR. To, personally, I would be more apt to, to be for it. But but then again, I, I live in Bayou, and I, I just know what it's like. It's just one little bit by little bit. You just the residential is just becoming more commercial, and I just don't want the Isaiah district to become. Well, that's another thing that I understood that we can't, we would never, we do not make changes in the Isaiah district. We we would not change the home or the structure or do anything that would change that historical part that i understood that so i mean i've lived there for 24 years in fact right. i would want to always protect that so and in our will and all our children get the home we have eight daughters and they all have and they've grown up there so we just kind of a family there that that's that family home so Deborah. I'm just saying I recognize it's in the historical district and I want to protect that. That's a value to me. Deborah, our option here, do we table this and send it back to planning and zoning and have the applicant file for SUP? What would be the proper course if that's the route we want to go? Or do we deny it and have the applicant then go back to planning and zoning and apply for SUP? Okay. Or can we approve it as an SUP? Yeah, can we go ahead and just approve it? Because it's a less or it's, it's more restrictive use than the RPO is, um, or AR, AR is, pardon me. 
So, Tom, what's your thoughts on that? Right. So, in some respects, you know, typically, if we have a zone change for a straight zoning district, so not restricted, like a, like a C2 or whatever, and then city council can make it more restrictive by approving a, a plan development that has stipulations and time frame and things like that. I think maybe that's that's similar to this case where the the, the public notice was for you know everything under AR uh, straight like a zone change straight zone change. And this is, this is perhaps more a, a, an option to limit the approval, you know, the uh, to to just uh, to maybe one of the uses through this process. So it's not in this case, it's not going to be a zone change anymore. It's going to be a, a special use permit, which is the same process. A long story short, I I, th I think that um, like Ed said, this would be something that would be more restrictive than what was notified. And so it, it could just be considered here. So is that a yes or a no? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was very careful. Uh, it's more restrictive. That's what so we I pay mean, for. I don't think people will complain because it's like it's more restrictive. So it's yes, it restricts the uses. Yes. It's a very good legal counseling. answer. Do what? It's a very good legal answer. So can we? I'm trying. Can someone make a motion <laughs> to, to do a yeah, special use permit from today? The, yes, someone from the council could make that motion uh, for. Typically, like I said, the timetable is you can choose between one year, two years, three years uh, for that uh, before it needs to be renewed. Uh, yeah. I think, Council, this is something that I've heard also is that this is kind of a good trial work to see how, how it works there mm -hmm. for that location. Right. So I, don't want Ms. I don't want her to start this process over. Yeah. And I sure and don't no, want it to be, I don't I don't want to be to denied to, where she has to wait six they, months. The sign, you know, the, obviously already notification has occurred to the neighbors. You have one neighbor that's in opposition. Uh, just. Anecdotally, I drive by there all the time, so there's, you know, you, the sign is very clear. And again, you're being more restricted in what the use was that she asked for. Um, so, council can make that decision today. So, if we decide to go that route, would you be okay with that? Uh, with with a, to with, you, would, you would be able to do your notary business. It would be under a special use permit. The council, we would set a time frame for that permit when it has to be renewed, one to three years. We can pick, the council can pick the, the length of that. It's a trial run. If there's no problems, great. Okay. It could yeah. be renewed for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Plus, it would make the mayor feel better that there might be one less law office in his neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand. <laughs> it, I understand. The, the one on the, as Kyle mentioned, okay. is with an SUP, <laughs> your signage you is very small. That okay. Um, okay. And I imagine you're going to do most of yours probably by appointments. Yes, it's always that. Okay. And that's one, you know. Well, what I was going to say is that typically you can have a, a home office uh, in any district. The the major restriction there is that you can't have any customers coming and going. So you can have a home office, but no. Uh, no customers coming and going. So in this, in this case, it seems like this is more of a the next step up. You know, still a, a very small notary business office is really small in in, in nature. Uh, that that's this SUP is really opening it up to allow for a limited a trial run for for customers to come and go. It sounds like. Yes. Kyle, what did you say your vote was? Planning and zoning vote. Six to one. The, the six, plan six commission, yeah, was six to one. Six to one. Yes. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we uh, consider adopting an ordinance approving the zoning change from R1B single family to SUP for this uh, address. For how long? For many years. Three years? Three years. Uh, hey, James, it would, I, I agree with you, but I don't think it would be classified as a, a zone change. Right. It would just be a use, use change. It's a zone yeah, application, yeah. but yeah. it's not a zone change. Okay, mm -hmm. use change. Yeah. I'll second. Do we need to clarify that motion? I think, did, or Cassandra, did, were you able to catch uh, what the final motion was? I'm sorry. Were you able to catch what the final motion was on that? Uh, I mean, what was it? Yeah, what would you identify as? Yeah. Tell us what motion we need to make. 
to approve a special use permit for a three-year period of time for a notary office. That's simple. Make a motion on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> three to approve a special use permit for three-year period. I second. Okay. Got a motion by Williams, second by Haney. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Z4. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, this is a zone change request from R1A single family and RMF multifamily to PUR plan unit residential on Holly Tree Drive. Uh, this is to allow for the development of uh, nine residential lots um, where it's currently zoned for R1A, which could allow for up to six residential lots. Uh, this is south of uh, 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 a church to the north, and then there's multifamily and townhomes to the west, and then a large drainage uh, channel to the east. Uh, this is consistent with the future land use guide, a single family. Uh, you can see the, the property here. The, the floodway on the east side will, will have to be re will remain as, as is, and they plan to put homes uh, along the west side of the, the floodway. Uh, as you can see here, the, it just shows the, the lot arrangement. There is a, uh, a walking path that goes from Holly Tree to the, to the, the back of these lots along the, the floodway, uh, just as, a, as an amenity to the, uh, the, the future property homeowners. Uh, as you can see here, just I'm trying to illustrate here how the, the driveways will look on Holly Tree. So if you go further south of uh, Reek Road, there's currently a development there, that, which you're seeing here, that shows <coughs> Uh, where they've limited the driveway access to Holly Tree through three driveways and everything's shared along the front. That's how this would, would function as well, which is uh, in terms of uh, limited driveway access onto Holly Tree where there's, there's currently a, there's a collector street uh, between Grande and the Rice Road that, that would limit the, the driveway curb cuts. Um, you can see uh, of the notices that we received, uh, two were returned opposition. Uh, for five and a half percent um mainly the concern with one of the property owners was drainage it would, you know as you develop the property how it might affect drainage but like i said they'll have to steer clear of the the floodway and then also there was a concern about uh maybe that this this property could could instead be for something more higher intensity like a like a light office use as you as there's currently an office uh, just south of these these lots uh, but that was rezoned and uh, developed, I think, with uh, as, as an extension of the church. Um, but there, it's currently zoned uh, single family as it is, and so it could be developed that way. But that, that one neighbor did say that perhaps you know some offices through there might be nice as well. So they they opposed the the change. Uh, the plan of commission uh, by a seven zero vote recommended approval. I struggle with this one. I felt, I felt like I woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. <laughs> uh, it wasn't too long ago that, that it was brought to our attention that we've got drainage issues around Glenwood Church of Christ. So we're in the process of doing an extensive drainage study for that waterway. Yeah. And that was brought to us by the church, this, this issue. And so now we're talking about rezoning it to where instead of having six place six lots it's to ten or nine i believe it's nine homes uh ten lots okay. one of them being like a common area so we go in there and we do the zoning change and they build ten houses right before we finish the drainage study and the drainage study says we need to go in there and put in the retaining walls and all this work but all of a sudden, we've got all these houses in the way. Yeah. I just, we, and I've got a card from the applicant, but and we'll call him up. But it's it, to me, it seems like we're getting the, the cart in front of the horse. But any other comments for Kyle before we call the applicant up? Mr. Mayor, I do. <clears throat> Kyle, you kind of touched on it a little bit. And my concern, in addition to the drainage issues, <clears throat> is the consistency or. or lack thereof when you move it from the south end to the north end of the residential and the PUR and then you have that RPO there 
<clears throat> is it possible to keep that section between the church uh, and that current RPO, make that RPO so there's some consistency there? Right, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, there, there, with, with this approval, as, even as it currently is today, there is a, the ability to put homes between, between the church and the, uh, the, the office there. Changing this to a higher density residential still uh, can lead to that situation where you have homes instead of offices. Um, I think the response to that, though, is if, uh, if the zone change is denied, because perhaps council feels that um, there, there is an op opportunity, op opportunity here for something more uh, non-residential, then, then they, it, that wouldn't preclude the ability to, to develop homes still. Uh, however, it may indicate to the owner uh, that, that that is an opportunity that they could, they could explore this for non-residential instead of residential where maybe they didn't feel like that was an option. So that could indicate to them, uh, you know, if, if, if the request is, or the, the, the will is to keep it, uh, to not approve it, but, but to suggest maybe something different, mm -hmm. which I, you know, looking at it, I, I think either it could go either way on that uh, because you do have office there uh, that that does that does make sense with a lot of the uh, kind of the density in the area, the the the, the housing types that may support um, office development for that for that location. So I know that's another long-winded answer, but uh, that 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 would be what you would be telling the, the applicant that if 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 you, you think office is better, then they might be able to try that. I follow your answer. So <clears throat> if you couple that with then the drainage issue right. with the lack of answers that we have on the on the drainage issues would that preclude the applicant from then moving forward and doing something with the current zoning uh no so um when they develop this if they were to develop develop it as is they would just have to meet all of our requirements uh for for drainage and for residential is Mainly going to be, you know, telling us where the water is going to go uh, with the current with the current layout or current site, um, and so the the net in increase in number of lots or homes with the zone change, um, you know, that's that's kind of the, the difference. So, but they can still develop it a as it is. If it were to be office, that that has typically has more impervious cover as well. So. That could cause other drainage, you know, issues. But again, they would have to they would have to tell us during the plan review stage, mm -hmm. you know, how they're going to accommodate that, and that that's true for any development. The developer or the the applicant is here, Mike Smith. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to him to get for some of these yeah. questions. Are y'all ready for Mike to come? Well, up? one question, Ed. What's our timeline on the drainage study? The drainage study uh, is currently underway, but you're probably still another. You know, typically nine uh, to 12 months before you kind of have that back. And then that's just on the setting front. Then you also have the construction and all of that. that, that will, uh, Once we figure out what needs to be done. Exactly. We don't know. Correct. Okay. And uh, Darren uh, Jennings, our city engineer, is back there if you want to speak to him as well about the drainage study in relationship to uh, that channel that goes back there. Um, and so kind of throw that out there as well. My, my whole concern from what I've watched this through the years and just, just like the, the church asked us to step in is bank stabilization. We've just seen massive erosion go on and on and on. And because there wasn't bank stabilization on part of the church or the credit union, whomever, because they couldn't foresee in the future, uh, the tax dollars and the city's paying for drainage studies and bank stabilization now along development. And, was all this discussed with the applicant concerning this, that there might be some requirement or they need to engage with engineering to understand that that bank needs to be stabilized to a certain degree and uh, engineered so that we're not coming back later and fixing it. Right, we don't want to end up with another Ashmore. Ashmore, I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> uh, is Mike Smith here? You want to come on up? Not really. <laughs> yeah. uh, name and address for the record. Mike Smith, uh, 1310 Bellhaven Court, Tyler. Is that what you wanted? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to 
clarify this, I'm going from six lots to nine lots, not 10. And to address your concern about the um, access, the southmost lot, um, the planning and zoning required us to do an easement for them to be able to get you know, from Holly Tree Drive back to the channel that runs back there. Say it again. The, there's a, how wide is the easement from the recall? The, we are, the city, re, or the planning and zoning required us to do an easement on the southmost lot for the, to be able to access the drainage for maintenance behind. Yeah, I think, I think our concern is not access to maintain, but make it more stable so maybe we don't have to maintain as much and need that access. So literally running the whole length of the development, stabilizing that whole thing. Are, are you the developer or the owner? Or, I'm sorry. I'm the owner. Owner of the property. So are you with the church or did you buy it from the church? I bought it from the church. I bought the, I bought the lot or the land after the planning and zoning approved it. Uh-oh. Those churches are getting smart. <laughs> do I? <laughs> but, there, you know, what, I, what I'm doing, I don't really understand what y'all are talking about, about the office. I mean, there's, there's one office um, that's along that, that street. That, and that's rest, my point. There's, there's the rest of it is residential. Smashed in between houses. And if you go back and look at the previous zoning issue that just came up, there was a hesitation to change that zoning because of what was around it. And I get the stuff across the street was different, but if you look at what was behind that law firm and those other offices, it wasn't RB1, um, which, you know, she was wanting to change hers, but everything around hers was RB1. If you look at this specific instance, it's the exact same thing. What you have next to it is not consistent. You have the residential down south, and then it jumps to RPO, so why not keep it consistent and keep it or, or change it to RPO? What is RPO? I don't remember. You can have a, a small professional right. office. I mean, every that is the only RPO. That's my point. Why does it need to be in the middle of residential right above it and residential right below it? Why I'm, not I'm building that? I'm building single family houses. Is that? Yes. I'm, I'm not following you at all. Is there something I'm not understanding? I mean, there's I'm there's, just that, talking to there's the one office and every everything on either side of the property, with the exception of the church, is residential. And I mean, it's as it as it sits right now. I could build six houses with six curb cuts onto Holly Tree Drive, and all I'm wanting to do is go from six lots to nine lots with two curb cuts on Holly Tree Drive, one at the south end, one at the north end just exactly like what is built, you showed a picture earlier, further south. It's the same, the exact same thing. I think what the council was asking about is the fact that you have, you're going on Holly Tree Drive from a church, uh, so kind of a institutional use, and then there's the office piece in between, and you know, logic dictates that perhaps the highest and best use is then not single family residential that's along there, or just residential, but instead, is there some type of buffer use, such as offices, uh, that could go along that Holly Tree Drive component across from the apartment complexes versus more residential? Uh, are you primarily just a residential home builder? Is that uh, yes. your trade? Yes. Okay. I don't have any interest in building a commercial office. No. Is Darren back there? Yeah. He is, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Smith. Don't, don't leave. <laughs> Boards were more interesting than this. I think. <laughs> well, they had babies, so you know. It's, we always recommend people bring babies to the. the, the, the. So, how do we keep from having another Ashmore? So maybe you weren't familiar with Ashmore. Or, I'm not familiar with Ashmore. How do we deal with this drainage in construction of houses? Drainage study: houses falling off into a creek, us having to pay with taxpayer money to fix something after the fact. How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect ourselves? We enforce what's already on the books, basically, that the, if there, where there is an easement, but it's not a city dedicated to the city, that the homeowner 
or the property owner is responsible for any maintenance on that creek, period. It is not up to us. Now, we are, uh, they are building all these lots are pretty much in the floodplain, mm -hmm. almost exclusively in the floodplain, not the floodway. We have a restriction. You cannot build in the floodway whatsoever. We do not have a restriction. You cannot build in the floodway, excuse me, floodplain. So they are building in the floodplain, so it was going to constrict it a little bit more and make it the water go a little bit faster, I believe, potentially by doing that, which is probably why these lots are not built upon at the current time. They're one of the last ones in the area. But as far as developing these commercial versus the residential, there's not going to be a lot of difference. We're going to have to deal with nine homeowners rather than six would be about it. But it is their responsibility to do it, and we have to, uh, we'll have to start enforcing that instead of us having So, Darren, it. like on lot 29, which is the southernmost lot, which you and the picture 29, 30, 31 are the largest lots, and you can see the channel way going through there. How far back does the home, a potential homeowner have to build away from that channel to have any structure and their maintenance is their total property or Correct. into the channel? Correct. That is correct. Property owner is responsible if there's not an easement dedicated to the city. So here, here's the challenge I see. Is it's just like you said, that property owner. You build six or nine homes. The developer, the builder builds them, sells them. Mm -hmm. And then that individual property owner, when they have issues, find out they're responsible because there wasn't proper, let's say, bank stabilization mm -hmm. engineered to a certain standard because it just wasn't done. How do we as a city make sure in an instance like this that this developer engineers the proper bank stabilization so that later down the road, the individual homeowner didn't come into the city saying we've got erosion. It's just maintaining it rather than having to actually do it itself. That, that is just a part of the process we would have to, you, you can, I believe you could probably say that. We need to make sure that the, the developer develops these, pro, these lots and um, basically stabilizes the creek against any erosion because that's what we're running to previously on the opposite side, that the backyards are, are starting to cave in and it's just erosion was not, ero it was not, the banks were not stabilized on that. So we could do that as part of the log grading plans or as part of the um, contingent upon, you, you can make approval of this maybe with legal advice, contingent upon stabilization of the creek banks on these, on these sides. But uh, I, I agree with that, Darren, but we don't have our study back yet that's going to tell us how the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. We may ask the developer um, and may give them certain requirements, but then we get our study back and we didn't give them the right information. So then, you know, we've got a study that says one thing, but we told someone someone else. So does that then put the liability back on the city? It can, I would, I would think, potentially. From what I understand, just with the developer here, is there hadn't been adequate or really any discussion because the questions he's been posed by Councilman Haney and some other questions, you know, these are kind of broadsiding because he just bought the property. So how do we get a conversation between he and the city and the engineers and drainage to understand what's going on here, what we're talking about? If, if you'd like to table this, we could we could make sure we meet with we could set a meeting with them and discuss all the requirements for that, and then that way, there before everything ever happens, it's all set out in stone. I think that be good. I think that's an ideal. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with with tabling, and that's going to be my motion. The the Sorry. point I would also like to add is <clears throat> the owner is correct. He, there's nothing stopping him from going out and building what it's currently zoned for. And so my caution would be for, on the approval process, for him bringing, bringing whatever it is to, to development about what he could do drainage-wise to hold off on any of those approvals until we get the drainage center back. 
So I'm, okay, so, so, so I'm gonna I, make a motion. Yeah, so I'm, to I'm gonna make a motion to table it, and and it's gonna be a long table because from what I heard, it's gonna be nine to twelve months until we get the drainage study back. But I don't want to do anything until we get the drainage study back. And so I, I'm gonna table it. For, I move to table it for twelve months. Second. All right, got a motion by Handy, second by Nichols. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Z5. Right. This is a zone change from R2 to family, to R1D single family. Uh, and this is to allow for these properties here uh, to be re subdivided. Uh, all the surrounding properties are generally developed with two family and single family homes. As you can see here, there's three homes on this, on the one lot. They plan to uh, subdivide each lot into indiv individual uh, properties, and therefore the, the property owners can pot potentially own their own the lot and the home itself. And so this is really a kind of a cleanup item to allow these three lot, these three homes to be on the individual lots. Of the notices that were sent out, none were returned in favor or in opposition. Planning Commission recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? So moved. Second. Got a motion by McKellar, second by Wynn. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Ooh, that was easier. <laughs> yeah. You don't play around yeah. in roll the road now. Roll the road. Let's keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a alley closure. Off of Hillsborough Drive, just for, uh, street, just uh, west of East Gentry, um, they plan to incorporate some of this into the adjacent lot. No opposition from any neighbors, and Planning Commission recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Move to approve Z six. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McKellar. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. This is, a, this is a change from C1 light commercial to PMF plan multifamily. Mm -hmm. This is also kind of a cleanup clean up item. This, uh, this piece was left over from a previous zone change. Uh, so they're rezoning this piece to uh, match the, the plan development that's planned just to the northwest there. Uh, this is over Elkton Trail, Old Jacksonville area. As you can see, the, the property is just landlocked and so they plan to use incorporate it into this development here which was the plan initially uh, no opposition was returned planning commission recommended approval any questions for kyle Move to approve. second got a motion by mcgee second by mckeller any further discussion oh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. aye opposed motion carries z8 this is a request from <coughs> request from r1d single family Attached and detached to multifamily. Uh, this is to uh, rezone this this property, which was previously R1D for for townhomes, into uh, a multifamily development, which you you tend to see. Uh, this is this is uh, off Hav near Haverhill Drive, uh, close to Old Omen and the UT area. And so you do have some multifamily in the area as well as well as single family and, and industrial activity. Um, this essentially will allow this property more flexibility in what they plan to develop. Uh, we didn't receive any letters in opposition, and the Planning Commission recommended approval. Uh, any questions for Kyle? Move to approve Z8. Second. We've got a motion by Wynn, second by Nichols. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Z9. This is a request for a zone change from R1A single family to AR adaptive reuse on Tipton Avenue. The Planning Commission uh, denied this request by five to zero or five to vote, five to two vote, um, and the applicant is appealing that denial. Uh, this property is on Tipton Avenue, just south of Moore Elementary, uh, between Fifth and, and Moore Elementary. They they plan to utilize the property as an accountant's office. Uh, and generally the area is single family. Uh, as you can see here, they, they plan to make some modifications to this house, which include adding additional uh, parking areas to the rear of the property and the, the front of the property. 
Uh, with AR, they would be required to, or they have a limitation on, on how much of the front yard can be paved, uh, up no more than 55%, which is typical for any residential zoning. Uh, ARs are, AR zoning is intended to retain this residential character. Uh, this arguable here whether that with the additional parking space, parking pavement, paving that they plan to do if that meets that intent. Um, this is some of the pictures of the property. We did receive one letter in opposition from the neighbor to the south, uh, just citing concerns that the, the area is residential and should stay strictly residential. 4.84% uh, calculation for for protest, excuse me. And the, uh, like I mentioned, the planning commission by a five to two vote denied the request and the applicants appealing that decision. Any questions for Kyle before we call the applicant up? I mean, this is basically a, the same discussion we had earlier with it the is. notary office, uh, changing mm -hmm. zoning in the middle of a residential. Um, the so difference from the other one is that uh, uh, an accountant's office or a tax office is spe called out in the code as a specific land use, and so a special use permit okay. option will not be here. Okay, what was the reason? What was the reason for denial? Uh, there was a there was a neighbor in attendance that spoke out with concerns about additional traffic and additional, you know, people coming and going to the area. They they indicated that's kind of a quiet quiet neighborhood, so. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's generally what the concern was, but the neighbor did. That was a different neighbor than the one that returned the, the, the red you know, area there. That was the other neighbor concerned was concerned with, you know, allowing anything other than residential. Okay. Bring back the zoning map just so they can get a good indication of just the of what we're there again. And so this is this is a a block that is you know the block faces or has frontage on Fifth Street, but this is. The furthest house on that block. There's no, no other additional uh, AR. Oh, excuse me. This is the, the map. No AR or office zoning within the area. All right. Uh, Al Vasquez, yes. you want to come up? Yes. I really don't speak. My wife told me to fix my hair because I was going to have to do so today. <laughs> if you can just state your name, name and address for the record. My name is Al Vasquez. Our address is 312 County Road 279. Tyler, Texas, 75705. You just made a best friend with Ed. Exactly. No, I'm fucking. Yeah. We're on go the, the same, same barber. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, had a, we had a few concerns. I don't think they were actual complaints. They were just a couple of concerns. And I'll consolidate all of them into a few different ones. One of them was the signage. I believe that was an original concern. And um, I think the requirements have us a eight square foot sign, which would be a flat sign placed on the front of the house, and then a, a rather small one that goes on the actual brick mailbox. It won't go in or above the mailbox, and there won't be any standalone signs there. Um, the next thing that we had was uh, privacy, noise control, and the traffic. We really have some changes addressed, as we had indicated, to keep traffic off the streets. The back of the house actually already has concrete in an area that was used to almost like a patio. So what we plan on doing is uh, on Orville Hill Drive, making an entrance for the employees. The driveway itself is gonna be parallel to the person that was originally mentioned this, headlights and stuff like that coming in. The parking lot in the front will be for customers and that will have up to five parking spots and there will be no lights reflecting to the back because the actual garage has been enclosed. So there won't be any um, bothering with lights and stuff like that there. And then of course the traffic. When we look at the location of this place, the corner, you just go straight down and then you have Hughes Automotive and then you have Mama's. Everything is literally two houses away from where we're planning to be. And then right above it, you see the school. So there's already a lot of traffic through there. Our plan is to keep the cars in the actual facility without having to use uh, side parking or on the road parking. Um, the last one, again, was the location. Compared to the rest of the houses here, this is a 3,700 square foot home. Everything else around it is between 1,500 and 1,200 square feet. So the chances of this house selling just to be a normal residential planning in the future, to me, is highly doubtful. It has six, six bedrooms, a storage room, and an enclosed garage, which is ideal for what my wife is looking to do. Um, yeah, with all that being said, now it's the traffic and the noises and the ordinance. Uh, during the busy months between January and April, they only open 
from Monday through Thursday from, four to, um, from eight to four per schedule only. And then in the off season, they only open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from four to eight, again, by appointment only. So we highly doubt that any of her customers or even employees are gonna create any extra commotion that is already going on through these streets. It, we keep going back to the same place of spot, spot zoning, where you're zoning something totally different in the middle of a neighborhood. Right. And uh, anyway, any questions? For I share the same concern. It's just like Z3 and Z4. You're going to have one random P, P, uh, RPO or commercial right in the middle of a bunch of residential. I mean, you've got a, a neighborhood that was designed 70 years ago as a neighborhood with a school, Fifth Street there, and to start digging into the integrity of these neighborhoods. I mean, we need to preserve that, in my opinion, just like, well, even the one in the Azalea district, we just looked like they were fronting a major thoroughfare. And we said, uh, this is in the in there. Yes, you've got Hughes Automotive and everything else, but that's a commercial thoroughfare through there on Fifth Street. So I think the preservation and the integrity of this neighborhood is very important because it's an affordable neighborhood to get into. Young families get in there, and that's starter homes for a lot of folks. And uh, to start putting the spot zone in the businesses, I think that would violate that integrity. So if I can only comment to that. Um, I agree with all of you. However, when we look at the size of this house compared to the rest of the houses there, I highly doubt that this house is gonna be used for a starter up family. Again, it has six bedrooms. The rest of the houses there are all between 1,200 and 1,700 square feet. The one right above it, I believe is the biggest one or in the bottom one that's 2,500 square feet. So with seven basically bedrooms, um, huge office, 3,700 square feet. I personally don't think that that's what we're going to have if that house moves on to sell to a different type of investor or anything like that. And that's Kyle, just you, in my opinion. Sorry. Kyle, you said a special use will be, can't use a special use on this one. Not for that, not for this use. Okay. All right. All right. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we deny Z9. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by Nichols. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Z9 is denied. Uh, Z10, Kyle. This is a request for uh, from R1B single family to R2 two family on West 5th Street. Uh, as you can see here, the properties are uh, to the West and the east and south are single family <laughs> to the north is townhomes. We have seen this request uh, twice already at city council over the past or since 2022. Uh, each time, the other two times, it was denied by the city council. Um, the uh, and in, in staff's review, nothing has nothing has changed since those uh, those decisions. The, the other than the applicant has applied again to. Uh, to reconsider. This request was denied uh, by the Planning Commission by a 7-0 vote. Uh, the applicant is appealing that decision. All right, let's go ahead and call the applicant up here. Uh, Carlos Maya, come on up. You can state your name and address for the record. Carlos Maya, 827 West 5th. Uh, can you uh, go back on the picture where it shows the color of your map? Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. First, first of all, I'd like to um, say to excuse me if I say something out of line. Uh, I'm, I'm very nervous, and uh, this case is very personal to me. I'm back again because I'm having a hard time accepting the decision that uh, you have made on the uh, on this zoning. Uh, as you can see, this neighborhood is very. Uh, it has all kinds of structures. We got a car lot on one end. We got a, a body shop right next, or a mechanic shop right next to it. On the other end, we got a church. We got a PUR right behind the, uh, my property. That we also have another PUR right in front of it. We got the duplexes there. So yes, I'm not agreeing with the decision that you have made on this. Uh, as you did you get the letters from the neighbors on the? 
for it. Um, I know uh, five of them came in and they were for it, for the, uh, for the sun change. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, neighbors wrote a, a letter. Uh, do you mind reading it? He's definitely for it too. This was to the Planning and Zoning Commission? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is. Didn't work out so well. You know, what? I hate to be redundant, but. <laughs> I mean, you've been sitting here this whole time, and, and the last deal of Tipton was denied. Yes, sir. And, and this is a zone change, which is which is just similar, to, I guess, for a duplex yes, in place. the middle of single-family homes. I mean, you know, Councilman Nichols talks about the integrity of the neighborhood, and I realize there's a, a there's PUR behind it. Yes, sir. And there's a, a car lot down the street, but it comes back to the integrity of the neighborhood. And and when we start changing zoning because people want to change zoning, there's there's reasons why we struggle with it. It's not because we don't like it. It's just because it, it doesn't fit the neighborhood. But that's just me. Y'all feel free to. I mean, I, I appreciate your persistence. Yes, sir. I currently have uh, six units, uh, rental properties, and uh, I'm very thorough with my tenants. I don't rent it to anybody. I have application that had to fill out. They have it uh, pass a criminal record for us, and I wouldn't want to bring anybody to the neighborhood that it could cause problems. Um, I know that. Uh, I've been here <laughs> two times already. This is my third time, but that's because I'm just not having a hard time accepting the decision, and I just like to really to re uh, for you to reconsider it. But can you just not build a single-family home? Um, yes, sir, I can. I mean, that's that's another option. Another option will be just to build a vacation home there. But because I don't want to bring people from another states that I don't know nothing about to the neighborhood. I'd rather just, you know, go with the duplex. I feel like that was more appropriate and more uh, better for the neighborhood. Any other questions for the applicant? No. I'll make a motion to deny it. I'll make a second. We got a motion uh, by McGee, second by Nichols. Any further discussion to to deny this. Uh, all those in favor of denying it, say aye. 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 Opposed? Z10 is denied. Uh, Z11. Uh, this is a request for a zone change from C1 to PMX D1 on South Beckham Avenue for Pollard Hines building. Uh, the applicant plans to uh, develop the property or redevelop the property for uh, retail and on the, the Beckham side and then uh, multifamily on the east side. The, uh, this area is a commercial area. As you know, it's on South Beckham close to uh, Fifth Street. Um, many of the properties are developed with commercial uses and uh, the multifamily component will is intended to serve the uh, the medical or the midtown district medical office medical uses and activities in that area so uh, this request uh, would amend the future land use guide to, uh, to reflect mixed use center here we go so this is the property uh, you may be familiar with it and so they, they're currently uh, working on the site, but they're re redeveloping it for, for this purpose. Um, the, they, they have submitted a, a concept layout, which shows some retail uh, uses on the, on the west side, 
They plan to eliminate some of the driveways onto Beckham, which will assist with with uh, access, co you know, control or management on Beckham Avenue. So that's that's a that's a plus. And then, as you see on the east side, that would be uh, some uh, residential units, multifamily units to to serve the area. They have submitted a list of uh, um, you know development standards for the the development. But generally, the way to think of this is just a mixed-use development in the Midtown area. And so uh, none of the neighbors re uh, returned anything in opposition to the Planning Commission by a 601 vote recommended approval. Any questions for Kyle? Move to approve Z11. Second. Got a motion by Wynn, second by McGee. Any further discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. That's it for zoning. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Kyle says one more on. All right. What time is it? R1. Kyle. All right. Uh, this is a request for a uh, resolution uh, of support for a housing tax credit uh, project. <clears throat> it's for uh, the Moore Grocery Loft Rehabilitation Project. Uh, the last meeting, we did consider some, some of these requests and, and made a decision on one. Uh, this, uh, the applicant here is requesting uh, for the more grocery lofts uh, after, after communicating some, some additional information that may not have been uh, present at the time. They, they have indicated that um, while a, a resolution of support, which is what's being recommended here, is, would give them uh, 17 points towards their, their project, that resolution of uh, no opposition would also give them 14 points. And, and either one will, will help them with their uh, their scoring to be one of the, the top, if not the top, in the uh, the region. They've also indicated that they, they did receive a letter from the state representative already, which is, uh, in my experience, that that does not happen until later. And so they've already received a letter from uh, Representative Schaefer, which gives them a, an additional eight points towards their score, which, again, makes them one of the top scoring, if not the top scoring within the region and so they uh, as you may be familiar with the project they plan to rehabilitate the the more grocery lofts um, with with the housing tax credits which will uh, extend the useful life of the property by replacing and repairing doors roofs windows cabinets upgrading the appliances nice. uh, as well as installing new roofs and uh, the parking lot uh, resurfacing and so they, they intend to spend at least uh, $70,000 per unit on this renovation project and so it's, a re it's recommended that the city council uh, adopt a resolution of support for the affordable housing tax credit proposal for revitaliza revitalization of more grocery lofts at 410 north broadway any questions for kyle before we move on to the applicant yes okay, kyle a couple of questions uh, if we do offer a letter of support, they get 17 points. If we have no opposition, they get 14 points. That's correct. How does this hurt or does it hurt the applicant that we've already approved the letter for? Um, does it hurt them any more or any less now that we it, have two? It doesn't take away from any points that they received from, from the action we took last, last week or last uh, meeting. Okay. It does. Uh, it does increase the chances of receiving the project in Tyler. Okay. Good. All right. We got two cards here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if y'all care who goes first or who goes second. Hmm? Brandon Pitch and Quinn Gumley. Oh, sorry. It sounds it's good. It's good. <laughs> Gormley sounds better than Goomley. <laughs> uh, good morning. Right. Thank you for. And just to state your name and address for the record. Certainly. Brandon Fitch, uh, uh, 50 Frederico Oaks Lane, St. Simons, Georgia. So, um, good morning. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Council members, for having us back. Probably a little bit of deja vu. Um, we wanted to make sure, following the last um, council meeting, just provide some additional data points to make sure that the decision um, that's rendered by the council is probably the most informed. We did share in our last meeting that our project scores scored well, and um, that's due um, to a number of factors. Uh, a primary factor being as part of the 
revitalization district within Tyler, and it's also an adaptive reuse project. Um, that within TDHCA is incredibly important uh, with how they score and look at these projects. Um, correctly so, during the last council meeting, the self scores were shared with the council. Mm -hmm. um, our self score was below our competitor projects within the region. That is accurate. However, there are a number of additional factors beyond self score that are included with the TDHCA decisioning. Those factors like city council support, state representative support, revitalization uh, districts, things of that nature. And when you um, account for all of those point categories, we're the highest scoring project in the region by con a considerable margin. And so we wanted to come back here to make sure that you had all the data points relative to the project to, to render a decision. We feel very strong about it. We feel very good about getting an award. I want to thank Ed and thank Kyle for allowing us the opportunity to share that additional information. Again, the state representative support is also a very, very critical step. Typically, you don't receive that support of a project till after uh, the council meets. Uh, in this situation, uh, Representative Schaefer felt very strong about the project being part of that revitalization district and really contributing to the continued uh, revitalization of the downtown district. And so those additional elements are what we wanted to make sure that we were very, very clear about uh, with, with uh, getting back in front of the city council today. So that's, I'll keep, like I said, I'm just going to keep it concise. I'm happy to answer questions. My partner, Quinn, can share a little bit of his information as well. And then we also have our colleague, Lisa, here, who is a former uh, member of TDH. She worked for them for 12 years, and she's a consultant for us on the project. Yes, uh, Mayor, Council Member, good to see you again. Quinn Gormley, um, I'm uh, stationed out of BK, Texas, so I kind of made the trip up here. It's good to see everybody again. Um, again, you know, the scoring, is, scoring is, a, is a critical factor. Those other items outside of self-score are critical. Obviously, as Brandon had indicated, city support is, is critical for, uh, for that score. One of the things that uh, should be noted, though, is there are multiple applications in, that, in this region. The next deal that would score based on that tabulation criteria would be Longview Terrace. So that would be the next project that would be in line if our, if our development does not move forward um, in the application round. Now, that being said, THA still has to go through. They audit those scores to make sure all those scores are great. So it's hard to say you could just pick one out of the bucket. Um, they have to be financially feasible. There's all the other things that have to happen along with that. So, so it's really important that you, know, you, you show yourself score, you have the supporting data. But again, it's really up to the way that TDAC audits it at the end of the day. Um, as we feel very comfortable that the deal is very sustainable, it is at a point now where we need to rehabilitate it. The bricks need to be pointed and tucked. Um, it needs to be cleaned up. We need to do uh, trash enclosures, like formal trash enclosures, enhance security, build fencing around the property. Um, there are a lot of things that, that, and we're happy to share more uh, upon any additional questions you have, but there are, there are units, inside the units, we're gonna do a lot of cosmetic things, moving a new, new cabinets, new countertops and appliances and so forth, but those are fairly cosmetic. We definitely wanna stabilize the property and give it a renewed life, particularly since it's gonna be in the revitalization area. So. I have a question and it's, <clears throat> I asked you this very question the last meeting. If we were to award y'all the resolution, y'all were at the bottom of the self score list, does that propel y'all to the top? And you couldn't give an answer of yes or no. So at that point in time, did you have the same information or is this all within the last couple of weeks? We did. And, and Council Member, I was, you know, I didn't want to but, you know, I want to back down other projects that came in here, great projects that were that were before you that day. And to say that we were the highest scoring, we would beat all the other projects just really is not in my mantra to kind of beat on to beat on that. We're going to beat them up. Um, what I didn't understand. And after we after I left the podium was as, as Kyle was talking about the self score, it was really in the self score. And when you look at the self score, it is it is in the middle of the pack. But when you add the revitalization area and the other areas of scoring, we are the top scoring of all the applicants in the region. And again, the next project down would be Longview, and the next project down would be the project that, that you selected. So. And, and, and again, and again to, to add to that, um, we weren't aware, and, 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 and city councils handle these uh, requests differently, we weren't aware that the city really preferred to select just one project. So we, we've worked with a number of councils, they'll, they'll, they'll provide support to all three projects, and really let the TDHCA scoring dictate the winner, and so we weren't aware of that. We probably would have been a bit more vocal about our score. Yeah. Had, and had, and that, you know, that was kind of touched on, and the mayor brought that up at the last meeting of, we're not in the business of just doing a blanket 
award for everybody because we feel that hurts everybody in the long run instead of somebody that has the potential of becoming the winning, winning property. It's a very competitive process, as you know, and, it, and it's almost like going to buy three lottery tickets, mm -hmm. and, but only being able to have one. Like if you, you pick which one you're gonna use. So if you had an opportunity to take all three, you, you'd wanna take all three because you don't know how each one is gonna fare out. You, you as a council don't have a line of sight to all the other things that THC will be looking at on top, of the, on top of the project. So that's why this being a revitalization and a rehab, it's not new construction. So it, we felt it was a little different than the normal process. So, and that, that was on us for not leaning in harder on that. Um, so Lisa, uh, yeah, See I'm Lisa Vicchetti. I'm also from Austin, and um, I just had a question for the city council. Um, you mentioned that you didn't want to hurt any projects by supporting all three, and I'm just curious as to why you think you would hurt a deal by supporting them. I just want to make sure that it's not because you think that this, the points are spread across. No, I, I don't think anybody has that. I, well, I, what's happened in the past is when we did a resolution of support. It's been probably seven years ago. It's been right. years ago. And we did a resolution of support for all three deals. Well, the state rep said, you didn't help me out a bit. I mean, you, you need to do one so that I know which one to support. Or Got what, it. I, to, to consider which one to support. So... And that was a piece of information that was missing the last time as well, is that we already had the reps support for this deal coming into the city council meeting. Um, but just to, just to make sure you guys have all of the information, by providing support for all of the deals, and I'm not saying that you have to, I'm just saying by doing that, you're not really hurting any of the other deals. Everybody gets the same number of points for your support. It's not going to be spread across because it's one versus three deals. And I'm just stating this because it was something that came up during a conversation in the past. So I just wanted to make that clear. There, there was a comment about the 17 points and if the 17 points are spread across deals or if the 17 points are distributed okay. to the individual. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think anybody has that, okay. that concept. Okay. Question for you on your project. Yes, sir. At the end of the day, we, we go forward with a letter of support for y'all. Y'all don't get it. Longview gets it, Abilene gets it, whoever gets it. Are you still gonna revitalize your property? Yes. It, 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 Without the tax credits, though, because it's a tax credit program, we're limited on our ability to recapitalize the project. So we would have to go back in for applications again. Um, you're you're kind of on the treadmill to do that. What we don't know, and, and uh, nobody does, is TDHA will change its scoring. It does it every year. Um, we don't know if we'll be competitive enough next year to get the allocation. Um, and also timing-wise, um, if we get an allocation this year, um, we'll be under construction by this time next year. Um, and then we'll be revitalizing those units by, by the middle to end of next year. If we wait and get out to get allocated and apply again next year, it'll be two more, three more years after that. So it'll be until 2027 until we actually have revitalization of that project that time, being that we score well enough from TDHA. So as it sits right now, we score very well. So it's an opportunity you now that's in hand to, uh, to revitalize the project. And the other question that we, we through it, y'all. Uh, y'all noted at the time y'all were 98, 96 percent occupied, and you were going to displace tenants, relocate them during this process. Yes, I, which I is, um, you know, I, I guess you you've already identified like properties that you can move these people in that are available. The tenants are willing to do that. Yeah, there are there are a couple strategies for for that. Um, the the most the, I'm sorry, apologies. Um, there are a couple strategies for that. The least disruptive for our tenancy is to allow the property, if we have an award, to naturally reduce the vacancy. So as tenants vacate, we're just not going to relet those, those units if we know we've gotten an award. Even if we haven't closed on our construction financing, we'll go ahead and begin throttling the occupancy. And the goal is to renovate approximately 8 to 10 units at a time. And so if we re bring that occupancy down to 20%, or that, that occupancy down to 80%, which would mean approximately 15 units would be unoccupied. So when we start renovation, we can start with those first 15. When those are renovated, then we can move those tenants into those units that have been renovated and completely updated. They have the option to, to take that unit as their permanent residence, or they can move back into the unit that we've renovated while they've been in that temporary location. 
If we're not able to throttle the occupancy, I, I do think we will be able to, just based upon the history of the property. But if we're not able to do that, we will make uh, accommodations for them for a temporary housing offsite at our expense. It's not going to be their expense. And then we will relocate them back into the renovated unit. Yeah, so, so when they're relocated back in, is the rent the same? The rent does not change okay. due to the uh, lure restriction. We're actually increasing the affordability of the project. Currently, 10% of the units are reserved for 30% AMI uh, tenants, and the remaining 90% units are for 60% of AMI. With our rehabilitation, it will be 10% uh, are 30% units, 20% are 50% units. So we're increasing the unit count for 50%, and we're increasing the affordability for approximately 17 units. And then the remaining units will be 60%. So we're actually making it more affordable with this renovation and a better quality asset. And I want to be precise on, on the comment. Our goal for, for uh, uh, the in-place tenant rehab is what it's called, is to manage that so we're not displacing tenants. We are required to budget funds um, under the Uniform Relocation Act to cover any tenants that are or will feel displacement. And we are required to move them into a light property, similar size and shape and rent to cover that. So, There's also um, an added requirement since the historic property. We're actually going to be um, bringing in a historic consultant. And part of that consultant's job is going to be to make sure that we meet with the tenants, have community meetings, do one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. We've already sent out a notification to them that this is a possibility. And I've already fielded some questions. Um, so just rest assured that they're going to be involved in the conversation of how this is going to go. All right. Uh, I got a couple of comments uh, to kind of move this along. <laughs> uh, and I'll just say it. I like the project. <coughs> and we're in the middle of, of redoing downtown. And we plan to, to start moving dirt in October of 24. So I like the idea of the more grocery lofts getting a facelift at the same time as we are trying to improve downtown. And when you ask the question about why not do a resolution of support for all three, well, we're kind of backing into that equation now that, that uh, we know Representative Schaefer has approved or, or is supporting this project. And I, and I, I like that. The, the last thing is, is probably a little bit of my ignorance, because sometimes it, it, it's very apparent. But when you talk about the point system of 17 points, you know, there's been a time in the not too distant past where I thought that the one that got the resolution of support got the 17 points. And the people, whether you did one, two, or three, I was not aware that more than one could get the 17 points. That, so my bad for for that part. Yeah, no, no, and, and I'm glad and grateful to council, city staff, uh, mayor for allowing us to come back up and talk a little bit about that because that that and obviously this has been um, you know uh, council's will on how they select and approve these developments. So we appreciate the opportunity and know that this one is a little bit different because it is a revitalization project and not a new construction project. And I do believe that Representative Schaefer would not be supportive had we been presenting a new construction tr uh, project in front of him. He's historically not supported those types of transactions or has been very selective about that, so. All right, any other questions before we move on? I move to approve. Second. All right, got a motion by Hayden, second by McGee. Any further discussion? Also in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Good luck with the project. Thank you for your time. So really appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry, Ed. No. Well, yeah, uh, the, the point I was going to make was kind of to the question she had asked. Council in the past have also not voted for projects because they don't like the project. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's in the past, that's also been one Correct. of the issues. All right. O one. one Better be exciting. Yeah, yippee yay yay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so how quick do you I think all want this? <laughs> you have item 01 before you. It's our, our budget amendment ordinance. As you'll, as you'll remember, uh, we have already brought one amendment ordinance to you that's primarily all of our other funds, uh, 
and generally this is the one that we uh, put our grants on but also there was some other uh, items that we had attached to this one as well that didn't make it in the first amendment ordinance so uh, this is for the next item do y'all need can you find no. That's there you go yeah, there we go thanks Okay, so these are items that uh, just basically rolling over from FY 22, 23, um, and we'll just kind of touch on some of the highlights. Um, <clears throat> the housing grant fund, uh, we're amending the budget 366,000. That is primarily related to the housing cho choice voucher program. Uh, the CDBG, CDBG grants, uh, that 306,000, is related to demolition, public facilities, and, and some uh, leftover CARES funds. Home grant, uh, the almost 2.4 million there. It is new construction, first time home buyers, and some leftover ARPA funds there as well. And the hot fund, the 2. Point, almost 4 million there is to complete the Mayfair building. Um, the rainy day fund, it's the same project. We're actually transferring dollars from the rainy day fund to help uh, complete the Mayfair building and the hot fund will reimburse the rainy day fund. So, um, <clears throat> general fund, we got $155,000 additional transfer there uh, from the general fund to transit. Uh, that's to help continue on with the Saturday service. Um, as you all remember from uh, our constituents speaking out on, on that as a result of our budget. Also, um, on the transit fund at 305,000, that's the donation that we got, I believe it was from the Council of Governments, plus the transfer from the general fund. And then the airport was just a correction that we needed to make uh, in our budget document. So it is recommended the city council consider adopting an ordinance amending the FY2324 budget to provide funding to complete various CDBG home housing choice voucher airport projects for Tyler Panels Regional Airport, Transit, and Rose Complex for uh, the Mayfair building. Any questions for Kater? Move to approve. Second. Second. Got a motion by McGee, second by Wynn. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Those who carries M1. You have item M1 before you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is our revenue and expenditure report for the first quarter. Um, <clears throat> we'll just start out with some of our major funds. We're comparing the packet that you have compares actual to actuals and uh, our budget to what we're projecting uh, for the fiscal year. Uh, we'll start out with the general fund. We're expecting revenues to be about 2.2 million less than budget. That is largely related to sales tax. Um, we're currently uh, actual to actual, we're about 4% down on sales tax. Um, so uh, budget to actual, uh, we're down about $914,000. So we're projecting through the end of the year to be about $2 million less than budget. Uh, we'll update this as, as things change, but what, what we're seeing is there's a downturn and uh, we're seeing that residential sell, or retail sales tax is down, construction and manufacturing is down. Um, on the construction and manufacturing side, we're seeing price corrections on construction material due to you know supply and de demand becoming more equal. Uh, during COVID, we saw really large spikes in, in building material just due to lack of uh, supply. So, so things are correct in there, which means our sales tax takes a hit for that as so, well. Uh, um, also, we uh, yesterday in our executive team huddle, we 
visit with departments. Uh, we give them a benchmark to come in uh, two and a half percent under budget to try to offset what we're losing on sales tax. And so we'll continue to monitor and manage that uh, as we go through the fiscal year. Water utilities, we're expecting revenues to be about 346,000 less than budget. Obviously that can change quite a bit between now and the end of the uh, fiscal year, just depending on what happens this summer, weather-wise. Um, expenditures are expected to be about 3.9 less than budget. That's due to um, cost, uh, savings in chemicals, uh, we, our suppliers had told us we were gonna have much larger increases than what we really had. So we've got some savings there. Um, also savings in our CMOM special service account and uh, also on water distribution and waste collection. Solid waste, we're looking at uh, coming in about 313 thousand less than budget primarily due to a delay in uh, implementing our five percent cpi increase on our commercial accounts we're working hard to get that rolled out and hopefully we'll be getting those additional revenues coming in soon uh, expenditures we're expecting to be about three hundred and thirty nine thousand less than budget Airport, we're expecting revenues to be about 460,000 less than budget. Um, expenditures are expected to be about 152,000 less than budget. Uh, that is a fund as we go in the budget and have discussions with you all, a fund that, as well as solid waste, uh, that we're watching very closely. Uh, we're gonna begin to spend down the CARES grant revenue that we have. <laughs> And if we don't get additional revenues, we're going to have to make some changes either in our expenditures or look at increasing other revenues to make that keep that fund self-supporting. Uh, development services, we're looking at um, revenues being about 30,000 less than budget, but expenditures are expected to be uh, almost 39,000 less than budget. Hot fund, we're expecting uh, revenues to be about 345,000 less than budget. Uh, our occupancy rates are down about 12% uh, from what I've been told. Uh, also, after we put this report together, we did have a delinquent um, hotel tax collection and also we're doing some audits. So we may actually fin finish the year pretty close to budget on our revenues is, is, is what we're hoping. Um, but like I say, those those two items were not considered because this report was done before we actually received the delinquent hot tax payment and then we've got audit, uh, audit of several hotels and we're gonna have to visit with those hotels and work out a payment plan uh, for them to pay us as well, so. Kedrick, you want to explain to them why the 2.6 million is shown on there um, in relationship to uh, Oh yes, the that's, that's so a that's good, <laughs> that's a big number. Yeah. So basically... Okay, just go ahead and explain. We can, uh, okay. Cassandra. So basically that's the Mayfair building. Uh, that was amended in the budget uh, that you just approved. So, so that's why that's showing, uh, showing there. So once we get the budget adopted, and updated, the next report won't show that this, this large number. Okay, so we've got employee health fund. Well, okay. Employee health fund, <laughs> revenues are expected to be about 43,000 uh, more than budget. Uh, our claims are looking much better this year than last year. Uh, we're expecting to be about 1.2 million less than budget on claims. If you'll remember last year, we had uh, uh, we had excess claims, we had excess claims, but we also had stop loss revenue to offset that as well. So 
That concludes my report. Uh, we request the city council review and consider uh, accepting the revenue and expenditure report for the period ending December 31st, 2024. All right, any questions for Kedrick? Kedrick, one question. You mentioned during your executive team meeting yesterday, you recommended a 2.5% reduction. Is that doable or is that uh, yes, I, I, I think it is It is manageable. They're already, it, it equates to a little over $2 million. They're already forecasting, I think it was 1.3. So they've got to pick up another seven or $800,000. Um, so I, yes, the answer is yes, I think it's doable. Thank you. Anyone else? So moved. Second. All right. Got a motion from Mother Keller, second by McGee. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're down to the consent agenda. Uh, anything be, need to be pulled or approved is presented? Why everybody speak at once? Is that a motion? Is that a motion? Move to approve. Second. All right. Got a motion by Nichols, second by McGee. Any yeah, further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Everybody's coming. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wanted to ask. I wanted to change the I, just, I wanted to ask you the anonymous donor was, and then I realized it's anonymous. <laughs> we just wanted you to make a motion. All right. City so manager's report. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so, in response to the recent hailstorm that we had, the planning department has been contacted by a large number of mobile uh, paintless dent repair companies seeking to establish temporary locations within parking lots under large tents throughout the city to perform repairs to different vehicles. Uh, to date, the department has received about eight requests for transient vendor permits. Uh, while the city allows for temporary transit vendor sales, it is historically not allowed for permits to be granted for transient uh, auto repairs, detailing, or washing. For that reason, the department is, un is unable to grant those uh, vendor permits for this activity, but will communicate to interested companies that they have the ability to make arrangements with individual clients for dent repair sim similar to some windshield glass repair companies or to partner with existing auto repair businesses at their locations. Uh, and so this is an opportunity way that we're being able to kind of handle that uh, coming in because of the hailstorm. I know from the roofing piece has also been a lot of different companies kind of coming into town, uh, talking to different businesses and our uh, planning department has been working with those to make sure they have the proper permits uh, to be able to operate in Tyler. Um, has some good news and uh, information. Uh, you know, we often talk about the amount of kind of equipment, even anonymous donations uh, for our, especially our, towards our public safety department to assist you or I uh, when we are having our uh, times of need. But the Tyler Obedience Training Club uh, donated 22 sets of oxygen recovery pet masks uh, to the fire department. And these can be used to deliver oxygen directly to any size animal after smoke inhalation as they come in multiple sizes. A set of these will be available on all the front department's frontline apparatus soon. And that's been, you know, an interesting piece. You know, we all have our cats and dogs that we love uh, sometimes better than our children. Um, <laughs> I know my father has that about his cat. Um, he probably, you know, hopefully he's not watching today to hear, to hear me say that. Um, but my sister and I both definitely feel that, yeah, that cat's better loved than us. Um, but anyway, um, and so now fire departments, have, they've just been kind of a thing of where is, when fires are occurring, uh, they go, they rescue uh, the people obviously first. But people are care about their dogs and their cats, and sometimes that smoke inhalation affects them as well. So our fire department is very happy to have now this equipment on their front line uh, equipment or kind of front line engines to be able to handle those kind of situations. Our community member uh, last week contacted us about um, a solid waste employee, Terry Larue, and I would love to have this story and just wanted to brag about Terry uh, real quick for going above and beyond on his job. Here's what our community member wrote about uh, Mr. Larue. Uh, this morning around 6.30 a.m., my trash container was collected by a City of Tyler employee who noticed the smell of natural gas coming from our driveway. Our gas meter is about 40 yards from the street. Instead of dismissing it, this person called in a gas leak to Centerpoint Energy. Around 8 o'clock a.m., a Centerpoint Energy associate rang our bell uh, and informed us that the garbage man noticed the smell of gas around your house uh, and dispatched us. Our meter was indeed le leaking gas, and Centerpoint Energy fixed the leak and made sure everything was working. 
Uh, and so he wanted to recognize, publicly recognize Terry LaRue uh, for the work, for being able to call in that gas leak uh, and thank him for looking out for his family. And that is something just really is amazing. And then finally, uh, a major piece of uh, news that we'll uh, announce today is the Texas chapter of the American Planning Association uh, is announcing today that Tyler's Burkefield Park has been designated a great public space by the Great Places in Texas program. Uh, Burkefield Park joins Tyler's Municipal Rose Garden as the second great place in Texas to be designated in the Rose City. Great Places in Texas exemplifying exceptional character and highlight the role planners and playing play in creating communities of lasting value. This year marks the seventh year of the Great Places in Texas program, which has now designated 41 public spaces, neighborhoods, and streets across the state. Bergfield Park is only one of three places designated this year, uh, the others being La Verde Park in Kyle and East Hickory Street in Denton. The recipients will be honored at the Great Places in Texas reception in Austin on March 26. And so congratulations uh, to the council, to the city uh, for uh, this kind of uh, this great designation. Uh, and so we will uh, very, we're very excited about it. And again, kind of pressing that news out there about the fact that Bergfield Park, uh, the idea of the community built around a park uh, and just what uh, just kind of a, what it creates and gives back to uh, the community as well. Keeping the integrity of those parks and neighborhoods and everything is so important because years later, Amen. It is crucial neighborhood integrity. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Any other comments or remarks for Ed? May I recognize someone? Sure. Since we're recognizing, she's not in the audience, but I want to say thanks to our communications director, uh, Julie Goodgame, for working with me and collaborating with the city of Tyler and Tyler Independent School District for Black History Program. It's been outstanding, and so and her team as well. So I want to say thanks, and thanks to TISD for collaborating with us. And if anybody is interested, we still have one more event this coming <laughs> Friday night at Willowbrook Country Club at 6.30. If you need tickets, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and so move to adjourn. All right, we are adjourned. <laughs>